All right, guys. Uh, hello and welcome, as always, guys. Thank you, as always, for taking the time to invest in getting your mental reps, invest to recharge your mind. We all know we can get very busy with business, with life, with family, but we also got to continue to concentrate on working on the mainframe, which is why you guys are here. So I appreciate you taking the time to be disciplined, to have this in your calendar and show up. And, you know, as always, you know, we're bringing in another incredible guest and uh, Mike Mola was actually the first year of the harvest. He came in um, with his partner, David Moreno, and they delivered an unbelievable call. Um, but within that time, you know, I always like to ask the members, like, hey, what do you want to hear more about right now? And uh, a lot of people were talking about, hey, man, we're, you know, we would love to hear more about hacks with battling anxiety for entrepreneurs. You know, just have your mindset perform at a higher level. And there's one person that comes to mind that, you know, truly has mindset and business and life and energy and the spiritual world down to a science and who also does business at some of the highest levels of people that you will meet. And, you know, through my journey with knowing Mike, you know, a lot of times, guys, when we have people on here, I tell you to follow them so you can start like truly understanding who you who you guys get access to when I bring them in this community, because a lot of people don't understand. And then further on, they're like, wow. I didn't know that that person was doing that. And that's why I want you to be prepared because the people that we bring in here could pretty much answer any business or life question that's holding you back right now. But throughout my journey with Mike and becoming friends with him, I mean, he's introduced me to some pretty incredible people. We've, uh, we're very close to collaborate on some big incredible people, people that were in people that, that there were movies written about. Like, so Mike does stuff at the highest level, but most importantly, happiness is the biggest thing for me right and that's where i truly feel like he is a true specialist mastering entrepreneurship and also total happiness and fulfillment and that's what the harvest is about it's winning in all aspects of life not just having money not just being good in business but in your mind body business family all around and mike is a true example um, of this and by the way he will hit on you know, he's always ahead of the game when it comes to technology, as I put in the comments or in the caption, guys. I mean, he consults with some of the biggest technology companies. Uh, and now he's he's leading the charge with the psychedelic world and different uh, different me uh, medicine that is going to be the future of curing mental health. He's at the forefront. He's one of the influencers. He's on the boards of some of the biggest companies. And you guys are going to get kind of access to learn a little bit about some of the stuff that you will all be hearing a lot about in the future that's going to be saving tons and tons of lives. So, Mike, thank you so much for coming on here, my friend. As always, man, I appreciate your time. I appreciate my friend, our friendship, and I am uh, very excited to how you're going to be able to help amplify the mindsets and change the lives of many of these entrepreneurs in here. So welcome, brother. Thank you so much. Uh Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, depending on where you are. With that intro, Dev, I don't know what else there is to say. I think that's about it. We can wrap it there and call it a day and save <laughs> everyone, give them back 50 minutes of their lives. Uh, thank you. It's a, it really is an honor to be here. I know how much work you put into this, and I know the people that are here, uh, how important this is. And so uh, I, I really do uh, honor this, and I'm humbled by the opportunity to speak. And so I wanted to take a few minutes because of the, the topic that we're on to really dive right in and tell you why this has become such an important part of my life. And what I mean by the why is, you know, the what is success. And part of that is happiness, like Devin talked about. And for me, it became a, um, a real pivotal moment when I decided to change everything about my life because I wanted to redefine what success was. And, and I'll tell you a little bit about my journey and how I got there. So just to give you a, just one of my favorite little parables, a little story that I, I talk about to give you an example of what's happening when we talk about mental health and success and being an executive or being in business and facing you know, anxiety or depression or stress and different things that might otherwise negatively affect us. There's a story of, uh, of a Native American grandfather who, and some of you may have heard this, who, who is with his grandson. And his grandson is telling him that he's struggling. And the grandson says, grandfather, I, you know, I have these feelings that I, I just don't know what, what they, they mean. I, I don't know how to control them. I don't know what's going on. And his grandfather says to him, well, 
grandson inside each of us, we have two wolves that are fighting for control. And the one wolf is fear and anxiety and depression and anger and bitterness and all of the negative emotions that go with that. And the other wolf is love and abundance, happiness, unity, health, and all of the high vibration energies and frequencies and emotions that go with that. And those two wolves are constantly fighting in each of us. And his grandson hears this, he looks at him and he says, well, which wolf wins? And his grandfather says, whichever one we feed. And so in many ways in our society, we haven't learned how to feed the right wolf. And that often thwarts what we're trying to do in terms of being happy or achieving success. So I just wanted to start off with that because I think today's conversation is going to be about that. How do we feed the right wolf so that we are successful, so that we are happy, so that we're there for ourselves, so that we're there for our loved ones, because that's what's most important. And, and this isn't a lecture by any stretch of the imagination. So if I'm saying something that's of interest or that you don't understand, please just throw up your hand or just jump in, unmute and, and ask. Like, I'd love for this to be a dialogue as much as, uh, as, as I'd like to talk. So please don't, don't hesitate. So rather than let's just talk about what this means to do it, to, to be happy, to be successful, to try and figure out ways of reducing anxiety and stress and different things, let's actually do it. What I wanna start with is something that I call the fantastic fives. And there's something that happens in us and, and there's probably not enough time to get into all of this, but very often when, we're, when we feel stress or we have anxiety or fear, or depression or angst, there, there's that, that, that kind of struggle between the wolves that's happening within us, between our brains and between our hearts, back and forth. We wanna do one thing, we should do another thing, we have this decision and we don't know how to go. One of the ways that you can really work on figuring out what the right decisions are in a more effortless way is by creating what's called a heart brain coherence. And you can do that with simple breath work. And so if you find yourself in situations in life that are trying on you, or if you're going to be speaking publicly or you're going into a big meeting, you have to close this deal and you just wanna take a few minutes to make sure that you're centered, as we would say, there's, there's a way of doing that, that that I call the fantastic fives. And what that is, is a five second inhale through your nose, deep into your stomach, hold it for five seconds, and then exhale through your mouth for five seconds. So five seconds in, five seconds hold, five seconds out. You just have to do that four times for one minute. And you can all of a sudden reset yourself. You can start to create that coherence. You can get yourself back to center when something knocks you off course. So let's just, before we dive into all of this and we start talking, we ask questions, Let's do that because I'm sure you guys had busy mornings or busy days so far. I have too. Let's take one minute to breathe. We're going to count for five seconds in. We're going to hold it for five seconds and we're going to exhale. So I'll start it when I say inhale, I'll count it. I'll say hold, I'll count it. And then I'll say exhale and we'll do it again. Everybody good? Thumbs up if you're good. All right, here we go. We're going to inhale through your nose into your belly, hold. Exhale. Inhale for five through your nose into your belly. Hold. Exhale. Inhale. Hold. Exhale. Inhale, hold, exhale, how do you guys feel, thumbs up, relaxed, good, one minute anytime throughout the day, you know, the reality is that we learn so many things in school and in college and in life. We don't learn how to breathe, which is amazing. Thanks, Jennifer, um, which is amazing, right? We learn things that we think are important. You're welcome, Julia. Um, but we don't, we don't learn how to breathe. And, and if you're conscious about it, 
And a lot of what I talk about is, is meditation and mindfulness. It's creating this awareness of where we are physically, emotionally, spiritually in our lives at any given moment so that we can adjust, we can pivot when we need to, to get ourselves back to center, to keep ourselves focused so we can create that state of flow that's so important in being effective and being productive and being successful. And so we don't learn how to breathe and we find ourselves like, you know, a mouse that's getting chased through the hole by a snake and it starts to breathe and faster, faster. And it's all of a sudden it's up here and it's these short panicking breaths when we're stressed and you're not breathing effectively. It starts to release a lot of different things in your body that become more harmful and more de detrimental and increase or uh, exacerbate the stress that you're feeling. So the more we can take time to just relax, the more we can take time to breathe, the more we can work on our breath the more likely it is that we'll be able to control our stress and anxiety levels. And so that's something there are a lot. There's a lot of people out there that do this in very meaningful ways. You can take courses, you can go online um, for breath work, but it's really, really important. You know, when you look at just survival in and of itself, breathing is the most important. A few minutes without breathing, we're done. We can go days without water. We can go months without food, but breathing is the most important. So let's start with that. Let's be conscious of that. For me, you know, I just want to give you a little bit of an overview of how I got here, why I'm talking to you about breath work rather than being in court trying cases, which is what I did for the better part of 20 years. It's because that wasn't feeding the right wolf for me anymore. Unless I was doing this, that was affecting me negatively. And so I had I'd gone to law school. I had found my way to college, went to law school, graduated from law school, um, built out a successful law firm in New Jersey, practiced throughout New Jersey and New York. And built this out for the better part of 20 years, scaled it from two attorneys up to over 10 attorneys back down to six. And then about eight years ago, after I had built some other companies and done some other things, I started investing in uh, startups and angel uh, in uh, early stage companies, started really working with them. I realized that there was a, a, a bigger and a better place for me in this universe. It, it came from, you know, just being radically, radically honest with myself. And I'd been, uh, you know, lying on the couch of a dream house that my wife and I had just built, looking up at the 24 foot ceilings, amazing. And uh, I just had this profound feeling like I'm not happy. And it was like, how, how can that be possible? I've done everything that everyone ever told me I needed to do in order to be happy. Plenty of money in the bank, houses, cars, beach houses, boats, toys, go wherever you want, whenever you want. How can I not be happy? And, and I sat with that for a little bit rather than letting it pass. And I think that a lot of people that this happens to, we're so busy that we don't have time to give this the energy that it deserves to figure out what the universe is trying to tell us. And so once I was willing to sit with it, I realized that there were a lot of things that I needed to change in my life. I realized that because I grew up with a single mother who worked three jobs to provide for my sister and I, that money became very, very important to me. To me, that was the key to all of my freedoms, the key to my happiness, the, the key to my everything. And it wasn't until I had money that I realized that it wasn't that. It was a big part of it, obviously. It gives us the ability to make decisions and to have freedoms, but there was so much more. And so what I did was I, I began, as Joseph Campbell would call, the hero's journey. It was this, if you're familiar with the hero's journey, you, you know what I'm talking about. If not, you might want to jot down Joseph Campbell and the hero's journey. Really powerful. The idea that each of us are born into a certain existence and there's a calling. There's something that happens to us in our lives that if we're willing to answer the call, takes us into those caves to fight the dragons that we all need to fight in life, whatever they might be with ourselves and with others. And if we're able to slay those dragons, we get the riches, the treasures that the universe has for us. And we come out on the other side, the bigger, better version of ourselves. And so it was going through all of that, that I realized what I needed to focus on. It wasn't just my financial health. It was my physical health. It was my mental health, my emotional health and my spiritual health. What was I doing and how was I applying my time to myself so that I could be there for others? And as I sat with it more, I started to really try to figure out what were these methods, what were these techniques that I had never learned so that I could do it, such as breathing, such as meditation, such as mindfulness, all of these different things that would be able to help me. And I realized, you know, I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, The Power of Now uh, or, or books like that, but you realize that so much of what we do is either by living in the future or living in the past, right? Anxiety is created by us living in the future. Depression is created by us living in the past. The hero's, the hero's journey, yes, uh, Joseph Campbell. 
And so the more we're able to be here now, the more we're able to be present, literally in this moment right now with ourselves and with each other, the more likely it is that we can either absolutely eliminate or substantially decrease anxiety because of things that will be happening in the future or depression because of things that have already happened that we can't change because that ship's already sailed. So it's important to do that. So for me, it became a big part of it is through meditation. I, you know, I would be the first one if you told me 10 years ago that I'd be sitting here talking to you guys this morning um, about meditation, I would have spit beer through my nose laughing at you. I just wasn't that guy. Um, but the more I started to realize that the people that I was surrounded by, the people who are extremely successful, whose time is very, very, very valuable, um, the more I realized that they were allocating time to their day to do something like this, the more I realized that there must be something to it. So, well, let me give it a shot, right? It doesn't cost anything. And I can, uh, if I don't like it, I don't have to do it. That was about seven years ago. I've been meditating now 20 minutes a day, twice a day, just about every day, uh, sometimes once a day if it slips past. And by doing that, it gives us that awareness. Like, where am I in life? Where am I with what I'm doing? Am I happy? Am I not happy? What things can I do to make myself happy or, or to change what I'm doing? And those, those only come from you having that awareness with yourself. And if we're so busy and always focused on what's happening out there and not what's happening in here, giving ourselves the time, then we never get there. It's the old, you get on a plane and they say, you know, when the oxygen masks come down, put it on yourself and then help those around you. But we're busy, we're, we're entrepreneurs, we're successful, we have to conquer the world. We don't have time to do this. So we're out there doing for everybody else. And it's not until, you know, the universe sometimes uh, blesses us with humility um, that we, we realize how important it is, our mental health, our physical health. And so it's important to get out there in front of it so we don't suffer a breakdown, so that we don't have a heart attack or a stroke, or so that we don't suffer all of these things that might otherwise happen if we don't take the time to take a proactive approach to it. And so um, I was just with, if any of you have read either um, The Surrender Experiment or uh, The Untethered Soul, by a, uh, an author named Michael Singer, Mickey Singer. If you haven't read either of those, highly, highly recommend them. Literally life-changing. Michael Singer, I won't ruin the book for you, but um, ended up being wildly successful and through an extremely unconventional path. And a big part of it was through meditation and yoga. And uh, I just spent three days with him at his, he's got an 800 acre compound out in uh, Northern Florida. And we had the opportunity to talk and to, to listen to some of his speeches. And what he talked about was how so many of us are struggling because what's in here doesn't align with what's out there. And we're trying to control what's in here, meaning in our bodies, in our hearts and in our minds by what's out there. Trying to you know, put band-aids over things by, for me, I know it was when I was stressed as an attorney, when I was out there, really under a lot of pressure it was just buy something new or do this or distract myself with something expensive and fun and get out there on a new boat and forget about things for three days but that's really not the way to do it you start to learn that that's not sustainable there are sustainable ways of doing it and the sustainable way is by working on the inside right happiness is an inside job and so the breath work the mindfulness the meditation i'm not telling you that you have to meditate if that's not your thing but I am telling you that you really should take some time to think about having time for you, putting time in your schedule for you. This is me time. I'm working with somebody right now and, I, and he's a high level person. Time is like really valuable. He doesn't have time for, for anything. Just getting him to allocate 10 minutes a day for himself to go breathe, to turn the phone off and to reflect. And you'll be amazed by the answers that you get. Like I have, Devin has mentors and coaches. I have mentors and coaches. You all do. Um, you'd be amazed that you start to realize that those mentors and coaches, they really just help you pull the answers out of yourself. Like all of the answers that we need, part of our higher selves are inside of us. And we can, we can have those great mentors and coaches around us. They help pull those answers out. But if you're able to sit in quietness and breathe and just take time to listen, you start to realize that, that a lot of the answers are in there. So that's, you know, I just wanted to touch on that because it's something that I think we just zoom right past in terms of breathing. It sounds like, oh yeah, of course I know how to breathe. But until you stop and think about it, most of us have never had a course on it. Most of us never think about it. And it affects every single second of every day of our life. 
agree, Devin? Are we heading in a good direction? Is this where we wanted to go? 100, 100% agree, man. And it just, as you say that you were, you were talking about how you were catching yourself trying to buy stuff to change, pretty much change emotion. Right. And you realize that these were only temporary recently, you know, that's like something I've been questioning why I do certain, like certain patterns in my life. I'm trying to become more aware of this, right? Why am I, why do like the summer, right? It's like, all right, well go down the shore every weekend. And then I started realizing that I'm actually happier being in my routine that like, why do, why am I doing certain things or purchasing certain things and even, even drinking, right? A lot of times well, people want to drink because it's like an escape. There are a lot of things that we do that are just escapes, but we don't want to be real with it. And whether it's buying something and they think it's going to make a, a long-term change for you and it's just a short-term change of emotion and then you eventually get back to being that same person and that same old mindset. So you're hitting the nail right on the head and it's something that I'm, I'm trying to work on too. Yeah. And you know, something really important about that with regard to what you just said is, is the fact that it's okay to not be okay. And finally in our society, especially for, for men, it's okay to not be okay. And we have to number one, recognize that within ourselves. Like you don't have to always be happy. You don't have to always be upbeat. You don't have to always be all right. In fact, most of the problems are like you said, Devin, from when you're not trying to substitute things, trying to find that form of escape just to get away from it, rather than leaning into it, rather than processing through that emotion. Because once that emotion goes through you, it's gone. It's something though that you have to process through. And it's when you try to suppress it. I know from personal experience, it's when you try to suppress it, you eat more, you drink more, you go do you distract yourself with this and jump out of a plane and parachute and all those things to make you forget about it. It's still there. You're still, th you're still going to have to deal with it. So it's easier to lean into these things and learn how to deal with it. One of the things we do, um, let's talk about a little bit about biohacking. We talked about breathing. Let's talk about some other things. One of the things that you, I think you've seen us do, Devin, is um, we do cold water plunges, my wife and I. We started, we trained with Wim Hofs, one of his guys, and we, we do these cold water plunges and not everybody has access to a cold plunge or, or to you know, the North Atlantic uh, in, in January. But you all have showers. And um, so one of the things we've been doing now for years is taking a nice hot shower and then toward the end, turning the hot water off so that it's really, really cold. It sounds terrible, I know, and it is. And then turning the hot, yes, off. Um, then turning the hot water back on and warming up again and then turning the hot water back off in 30 seconds in the frigid coldness again and then back on and then back off. Why would we do this? Sounds crazy, right? Where there are actual Physi significant physiological benefits to doing this. Release of endorphins, release of, of dopamine, different things, creation of brown fat, which is incredibly important for our immune system. Um, but also psychologically, like when we, when we trained with the group that we trained with doing these, these ice baths, you start to realize, so we're going through the training, right? And it's, it's, it's about a three hour course the first two hours are all breath work, learning how to breathe, learning how to control your breath, find your breath. And then at the end, it's just that last hour where you're going in and out of the ice bath. And when you jump in, if, you get, if any of you have done it, you know, when you jump into an ice bath and you're submerged up to here with ice, your body instantly locks up. It's painful. And, and the, the coach or the instructor will come down and look at you and say, find your breath, find your breath. And then you start to breathe. And within 15 or 20 seconds, the pain starts to go away. You start to realize that you're not going to die and you can breathe. But the more important thing about that is it's a metaphor for life. Like everything in life is an ice bath. Diagnosis of uh, terminal illness, a bankruptcy, a divorce, loss of a loved one. All of these things are, are ice baths for us. And so if we get that, oh my God, what just happened? And you can't breathe. That's really, really a big problem. It's about being able to find your breath in those moments, in those ice baths that happen to us every day when a deal doesn't close, when there's a foreclosure, a house burns down, somebody gets in a horrific car accident. Being able to work through those moments becomes really valuable. So in terms of biohacking, that's one of the things that we work on. It may not be for everybody. I get it. But if it does, if it is, then that's something I would, I would suggest. Another thing, in addition to breathing, we talked about, like in terms of survival, 
I'm sorry for the background noise, guys. I don't know if you could hear the beeping. There's a, a truck here backing up. But um, Mike, real quick, why don't you tell everybody, like, what are you in right now? And like, uh, what exactly do you do? Every I want everybody to understand truly the life that you built. Yeah, yeah. I um, Right now, I am in my motor home in Palm Springs, California with my wife. We, uh, we left on January 1st um, of this year and uh, no timeline, probably somewhere between four and eight months, just traveling the country, meeting some of our business partners. We're investors in a, a variety of companies and meeting people along the way and just uh, seeing the places in this beautiful country that we've always wanted to see. So, you know, by doing, by applying a lot of these strategies that I'm talking to you about, by changing what I do on a daily basis professionally, I've been able to build out the kind of life that I wanted to live, which is um, freedom in terms of time and location. So uh, yeah, right now we're in Palm Springs. We're heading to San Diego tomorrow and then up the California coast and then back over through uh, the northern part of the country because we just did the, uh, the southeast and, and the su southwest. So pretty exciting. Um, any questions on any of this so far or any feedback or any thoughts? Do you, do you love it? Do you hate it? Do you have anything that you want to add? I know Hoff does cold plunges. Yeah, Hoff. Let's get yeah, it. Yeah, I was actually just going to ask. So, like, before I get in my cold plunge, I actually get my breath first. I do four seconds in, four seconds out. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so when I get in, I just continue that breath. And I don't count the seconds. I just count my breaths. And depending on the temperature outside, like, I usually get to about 20 breaths or so, which comes out to be about two minutes. Um, I've done a lot of research on it, but as you know, on the internet, you can find everything is 100% true and everything is 100% false on each side. Um, with with what you know about the cold plunge, is it true like you shouldn't exceed five minutes? Can you do 20 minutes? Uh, obviously, best time of day, I think, is morning to do it before your workout. Um, any tips on any of that with timing? and? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think, yeah, yeah. I, I don't disagree with you in terms of the breath work. Um, and in terms of the actual plunge itself, never more than if it's if it's truly a nice plunge, not more than a minute and a half for the for the first at least first six to, to 10 times that you do it. Like you really have to, to get up to it, in my opinion, unless you're with somebody that's going to walk you through it and be there for you in case something happens. I don't think most people want to take it to that degree. So that's that's typically yeah the recommendation and then uh, starting to build up from there. But good for you on doing it, man. Great to hear. We got to get together sometime and do it. Epstein um, <clears throat> asks, yeah. can you speak a little on any morning routines to aid with anxiety when you wake up? Maybe yeah. if it incorporates an, an evening routine into it or things you can do that over time will lower it. Love that question. It goes right into what I was going to talk about. So perfect. Yeah, that's perfect. So let's just start with the idea of a morning routine. By show of hands, how many people have a, a morning routine? Let's call each other out. Let's hold each other accountable. All right. So most of us do. I, I didn't for a long time until I realized, you know, all of the successful people around me. And by successful, I don't I don't mean they had an extra comma in their bank account over mine. I mean that they were living the life that they wanted to live in a way that they wanted to live it. And it was really powerful for me to see that. Um, but those people had morning routines. And so I about six years ago incorporated a morning routine into my life. First and foremost is when I wake up, that's when I meditate without going too deep. Like that's when the, the waves of your dream state and waking state are closest to what you want them to be when you meditate. So it sounds almost counterintuitive. Like, wait a minute, I just slept for six or eight or 10 hours. Why would I meditate when I wake up? And it's because you're, you're in a special place when you wake up in an undistracted place. And so it's much easier to where you should, where you, it's much easier for you to go where you should go when you meditate, when you wake up, before you become distracted by life. So first thing, my morning routine, I'll walk you through the whole thing. Wake up in the morning, first thing in the morning, 20 minutes of meditation. And meditation can be anything, guys. It can be just breath work, following your breath. For me, it's something kind of like TM or transcendental meditation. It's a mantra meditation where you repeat a certain sound or a certain phrase in your mind. Um, it could be OM, it could be anything. Uh, but the purpose of that is to help focus your mind on one thing rather than letting you get distracted. Like, okay, as soon as this is over, I have to go let the dog out. I got to make the kids breakfast. I got to get them to school. Oh my God, I forgot to pick that up yesterday. So that when those things start to happen, 
you can pull yourself back. So first thing in the morning, 20 minutes of meditation, undistracted. My phone doesn't go on. I don't, after I'm finished with my meditation, for the next 30 minutes, um, my phone doesn't go on, no TV, no radio, no anything. In other words, I like to program the day. I don't want the day to program me because as soon as my phone goes on or as soon as I take it off of airplane mode or as soon as you flip on the TV, I don't watch the news, by the way. I haven't watched the news in 11 years. I haven't read a newspaper in 11 years. I could probably tell you everything that's going on in the world from like intentionally focusing on what is important in my life. But I don't, I try to avoid distraction. One of the primary ways of doing that is to make sure that I don't look at the television or any papers or any internet or social media or any texts or anything that came in for at least 30 minutes after my meditation. So that's it. So about the first 40 to 45 minutes, undistracted, waking up, go through, figure out what the day is going to consist of based on my terms. Then that's really, I think, going to help with your anxiety because anxiety is a thing. It just it fires, right? It starts if we let it as soon as the day begins. But if we could take time to, and it might require you to wake up a little earlier, um, but if you're able to wake up a little earlier and you take those 20 minutes to yourself to just breathe and just focus, um, you're going to feel physically and mentally, emotionally more um, radiant, more focused, more energetic than if you just slept a little longer. There's a, there's a concept in meditation that, you know, when you sleep, you rest your body, but when you meditate, you rest your mind. And, and most of us don't rest our minds at all. We, we just don't. We don't allow ourselves to. And we don't let others to. So second part of the morning routine is I do something called Japanese water therapy. Uh, really interesting. So the idea with Japanese water therapy is that we are all terribly dehydrated in our society. We don't drink enough water, period. Um, so Japanese water therapy basically is drinking one ounce of water for every 10 pounds of body weight. So if I'm 170 pounds, I drink 17 ounces of room temperature water. First thing in the morning, after I meditate, I go over, fill the glass with water, 17 ounces of water, drink it as quickly as I can, not guzzling, but drink it as fast as you can. Go brush your teeth and then don't eat or drink anything for 45 minutes. Why? Well, the reason is it allows your body to hydrate on a molecular level. And so you'll see throughout the day, if you start doing this within a week or so, you'll see that you start feeling better. Um, it, you'll, you'll start to, and, and our brain is almost all water, right? I mean, when you think about it, the fact that we can't control our emotions, we can't think straight, we have fogginess, we have explosive you know, incidents where we're like, why did I say that? Why did I do that? Why didn't I do this? If you think about the fact that we're likely dehydrated, it makes sense that our brain can't function properly. So when you look at hydration and nutrition, extremely important for the proper um, uh, efficiency of brain activity. So one ounce of water for every 10 pounds of body weight, first thing in the morning, nothing to eat or drink for 45 minutes after that, and you'll feel great. And I can tell you, I saw it, you know, personally affect me. We have a, a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu Academy where I train with a bunch of these fighters. And I used to come off the mats after an hour of training, just like, Oh my God, I need water so bad. I can't take it. And, um, after I started doing this, it was like, you would come off and, and you feel, you feel okay. You're a little thirsty but you realize that you're properly hydrated. And that's not to say don't drink throughout the day like you should, but if you start your day off with that, um, that's I think going to help. Then I do sun salutations or some form of stretching or workout. Like while we're on the road, my wife and I do something called Tabata training uh, for physical workouts. And uh, that's T-A-B-A-T-A. -A -A. Basically four minutes, you can do an hour's worth of physical activity and, and you know get your aerobic and anaerobic workout in as much as you need to, to feel good. Because at the end of the day, like with the way you know, you're trying to reduce stress and anxiety and you're trying to become more productive, all of this plays a role, right? We're a system. We're not just like parts of a system. We're a system. So sleep, meditation or breath work, hydration, nutrition, exercise, sunlight, nature, all of that stuff plays a really important part. And so that's the final part of my, my morning routine. It's to try and get outside to get some natural light without boring you with the details. Physiologically, things happen from the sun when we, when we go outside and allow, in the morning especially, uh, morning sunlight to, to enter our retinas and to affect us. I just had this conversation with my real estate team on Monday talking about how sunlight 
is uh, just a big deal. Um, Andy Frisella had Tim Grover on what uh, on the podcast recently, and he was talking about how he changed his whole workout routine to where in the morning he does his cardio outside because how important sunlight is immediately when you wake up, how healthy it is for you. Um, and to piggyback off of what Mike was saying, guys, because I know I just know how people work, right? If you're in business, you're like, man, this could be a little bit over a lot of your head or like, why is this relevant to me right now? At the end of the day, ask yourself this question, right? If you woke up every day and you started your day with more energy, with a better mindset, with a better attitude, with a better look on life and with a better vision of how your day is going to go, do you think that you're going to have a better day? Do you think that you're going to show up as a better leader, a better husband, a better friend, right? A better salesperson? The answer is yes, 1 million percent. And so many people do not prep themselves to be this version of themselves in the day, which then goes into a lack of planning on their calendar. And then there's, oh, there's not enough time in the day. The woe is me. Or I'll start that one day, the one day people, I'll get to that one day, or I don't have enough time to go to the gym to work on my health, right? So when, I mean, listen, I know Mike is a very high level influencer, but let's just say you don't know Mike. Well, Tony Robbins says it too. So you better believe that if Tony Robbins says it, he has a routine of priming his mind, right? So it may sound like a lot when you hear Mike, like, holy shit, man, that is like a lot of stuff. But in the end, like at the end of the day, it's really not a lot when it's a routine. Like, how soon can all this be done, Mike? In an hour? Like some of the stuff that you're talking under, about here. Under an hour, yeah. Most of my morning routine is like 45 minutes. And it just becomes a way of life, you know, it, it, and that's that's part of it. So um, the one other thing that I incorporate, like I just want to make sure that we mention. So that's the morning routine. The other part of that that I that I didn't mention because it actually is not part of it because I don't do anything. What I do is not do something is I do something called intermittent fasting. So, you know, I've been doing that for about seven years now where we, my wife and I don't eat anything or drink anything after 8 PM again until noon the next day, other than tea uh, without anything in it, water or, or coffee. And so I'm not telling you that you have to do that, but if you want to, if you want to research some things that might really surprise you in terms of how they affect the quality of your life mentally, emotionally, and obviously physically, it's the benefits of fasting. And it could be for brief periods, but it's incredibly, incredibly important, incredibly powerful. We overeat in our society and our bodies are constantly taxed, metabolizing the things that we consume. And people don't realize that, you know, it, it's just like if you, this vehicle is diesel. If I put gas in this vehicle, we're going to have a big problem. And we're constantly consuming things that aren't necessarily good for us. And then we're wondering why we struggle physically or emotionally, mentally. We can't come up with the, the type of life that we're looking for. All of it is a part of it. Like I say, it's a system. And so for me, you know, that's the final part of my morning routine. It's not eating anything at all until, until later in the day. So even if you can maybe, you know, think about doing something like that one day a week, if it makes sense, you might see some benefits from that. And, and so that's, you know, that's the morning routine. That's how I get started with my day. But it really is, Devin, like you said, it's a way of life when you start to do these things. Or they really try to do is incorporate things that are sustainable, that aren't a real pain in the neck to say like, oh, this and that, this and that. It's just like the way that you start to live and you start to see the results. You're like, holy cow, why didn't I do this 20 years ago? Um, it, it, it becomes mind boggling. And, you know, all of this in terms of what you eat, what you drink, when you eat, when you drink, when you sleep, how much you sleep, whether you meditate, whether you don't meditate, all affects our vibration, our frequency, right? We are energetic creatures. Everything in the universe is energy. They used to think it was matter, but now with electron microscopes, you start digging down deeper and deeper. It's atoms and protons. This, And when you get all the way down to like the string theory and quantum physics, you start to realize that they're vibrating on a certain level. That in and of itself is energy. And so we are that energy. So if we want to be successful, we have to increase our frequency. We have to, how do we get it up here? Well, it's by making those choices that will allow us to do it. There's a great book called Letting Go by Dr. David R. Hawkins. Um, if any of you are readers and want to look at that, that really talks about this. And it talks about, he really quantifies and measures the lower states of vibration like fear and guilt and shame and depression all down here around 50 Hertz and then 60 and 75, 80. 
And then when you get up to right around 200 hertz, that's where something pivotal happens. That's, that's, that's the state of courage. And, and it's at that point where you go from a negative emotion or low frequency to a positive emotion and, and a higher frequency. And then once you get past that, once you get past that courage, that tipping point, then you get up to into abundance and success and happiness and all of the things that we want in life. And so it's important to think about all of these things in order to do that. These quote unquote hacks, they're not really hacks, right? These are things that people were doing for a long time. And somehow we've kind of gotten derailed by everything that, you know, we, we think that we're supposed to do. But you start to realize like as you go back, as you start looking at others, the way that they're doing things or have been doing things historically, they made a lot of sense, especially in, in other countries and, and around the world in different civilizations with different populations. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to talk about with regard to all of this, Devin mentioned it is because we're starting to close in on time and I want to little, leave a little time for Q&A is uh, a big part of what I'm doing now, why I'm traveling the country, I'm speaking at various conferences and events and, and meeting with various business partners is because we're focused now um, heavily, you know, in terms of our investment in time, energy and money in psychedelics. And I know that it's for a lot of people still relatively unknown. But it's starting to happen and we're starting to see uh, an opportunity for mental health to be cured, not treated in a way that it never has in our country. And you're starting to see, yeah, it's hu it is huge. This is going to be the future of mental health. Like we, we have a mental health crisis on our hands in this country and most people are struggling. 25% of the human population is suffering from some sort of trauma and depression is the, the global leader in the cause of disability. Uh, in, in people. And, and there's a reason that we're struggling. And so if we can get through these things, if we can make sure that we're doing everything right, physically, emotionally, spiritually, financially, but then we're still struggling or we know people who are struggling, that there are these medicines and these opportunities out there to help people in incredible ways that until now have been unavailable in our society. They've been available in other places around the world. I could tell you stories about what we've done for professional athletes and extremely high net worth individuals um, who are on prescription medication for depression, for anxiety, for addiction of all kinds, um, who just couldn't get the kind of treatment, you know, the 60 or $90,000 rehab facilities weren't working. And uh, with one or two uh, experiences or ceremonies with psilocybin or ayahuasca or MDMA or different things, their lives have been changed forever in a very positive and meaningful way. So we're working on that because that, not just according to me, who cares what I think, but in the eyes of people much smarter than me, the neuroscientists from Johns Hopkins, from uh, all of the leading institutions that are providing clinical research, show us unequivocally that this is an opportunity to help people who are struggling. And whether it's through microdosing, which is something that some of you may have heard of, uh, or macrodosing or transformational types of doses, these are opportunities that exist that um, can really change the quality of a person's life that SSRIs or antidepressants and different things can't. So we're excited about that. Um, we're working on it. We have a, a new company that we created called Webdelix. It's, uh, and I'm not pitching it. I'm just telling you in case you're curious, W-E-B-D-E-L-I-C-S and Webdelix is positioning itself to be the WebMD of psychedelics to help people who don't understand what any of this is. Like, wait, what is this? I heard about mushrooms in college or tried mushrooms in college. Um, versus like what's really happening in the world to help provide that kind of education. So we're doing that and uh, I'm really excited about it. So uh, if any of you are curious, there's also a great show on Netflix called How to Change Your Mind by a guy named Michael Pollan. Extremely, extremely good docu-series for a uh, introduction to what's happening there. Uh, yeah, so Michael, like, excuse What is that? Like, <clears throat> is like, I've heard... Uh, I've heard the term microdosing and I've heard nothing but great things about it. Is it like a pill? Like, can you give somebody like a basic idea? Like, is it a pill with mushroom? The stuff yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. So, so most of the time when you hear about microdosing, people are referring to psilocybin, which is mushrooms or people call magic mushrooms. And typically they're in capsule form and prediction, uh, they will become the supplement of the future for, for a lot of people. Like the way people take supplements and multivitamins today, people will be taking psilocybin, uh, microdosing psilocybin in the future. Uh, it's, it's incredible. You can see the results. 
it, their, their neuroplasticity results that people have that are quantifiable that you can see on MRIs where your brain, the synapses start to fire in a, in a meaningful way that they haven't, you know, in your lifetime. We have something called the default mode network that really sets kind of the stage for your level of happiness and your level of depression. And that starts to get off balance. And just like any other machine that you have to recalibrate over time, it doesn't matter what it is, you have to recalibrate them the psilocybin recalibrates and there are other ones that do it, but the one that most people are talking about is psilocybin. And so, yeah, so they'll, they'll, they'll take a, a micro dose, which is a, a very small amount. It's an imperceptible amount. So it doesn't have any psychoactive effect. In other words, you could still fly a plane. You could still operate heavy equipment. You could still go in and argue your, your case as a trial lawyer, or close your deal as a realtor or play your sport as an athlete. Um, but it does have the physiological and the anatomical benefits that come with taking psilocybin. So it's extraordinary. Um, I could send, I'll send you info and you can share it with your group. Yeah. What's so happening. like makes you more focused, gives you more like, like less brain fog, more energy, uh, makes you happier is this is like some of the, the, the things that happen when you like, some of the, for, I guess, when you yeah, micro. Yeah. Yeah. For a lot of people. Absolutely. Um, and, and it's a two part, it, you know, with with antidepressants, for example, they only operate in one one way. They, they attempt to reduce the depression with psilocybin. They're, they're, it's a two part effect. So it not only reduces the the depression, but it also increases. It has an agnostic effect on the serotonin uh, uptake network that that increases your your happiness, your the endorphins and what's happening to make you happy and uh, feel happy. Sorry, Mike, I'm trying to read what you said there. So yeah, so that's that's what happens. There's a there's an overall positive effect that you have in terms of clarity, focus, cognitive abilities, and your overall mood. And for people who have um, not necessarily uh, you know debilitating addiction, but addiction issues, um, really helpful for that too. You know, people that a lot of the people who I love as attorneys, you know, they'll be the first one to tell you that that they drink too much. You know, two to three martinis too many. At just about every lunch and then two to three martinis very often at dinner and and they're, they're not losing their jobs they're making a lot of money um but they're not living their best life because they're doing this and so you may not be you know under a bridge with a, a needle in your arm but you may be struggling with something saying damn i wish i could just cut out that fourth glass of wine every night um psilocybin and, and different psychedelics really have an ability to to help with that in a way that nothing else does which is why there's a massive um a massive uh, breakthrough or massive sales in uh, mocktails, non-alcoholic beverages. Yeah. There's a huge surge in that because people are trying to quit drinking. So this is going to be another avenue for them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's there's a great, great book on that, too, called um, uh, Stealing Fire. Stealing Fire by Stephen Kotler and Jamie Whelan talks about that. And they talk about, you know, the world's most <clears throat> dangerous dr drugs. And a spoiler alert, alcohol is at the top of the list there. Um, but it's okay in our society, um, but it doesn't help you, right? When you look at it, it, there, it, it can maybe loosen you up and make you more social, but overall, there are things that if you're, you're looking for a way to increase uh, the positivity in your life and, and to make you kind of that, that next iteration of yourself that you want to be, there are other things that are coming that are much more powerful. There are certain things, obviously, with psychedelics, you know, if, if you have a history of schizophrenia or bipolar uh, different things that you should be aware of. You should make sure that you talk to whoever you're, you're dealing with about that because it's not recommended if you do have schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. Uh, but other than that, yeah, extraordinary results. Awesome. So let's uh, let's get into anybody have any specific questions or anything that you're working on that you want advice from somebody who invests in some of the biggest companies who scaled massive companies or you know, a world thought leader, I mean, you name it. So if there's anything that you're struggling with or that you need assistance with, assistance with or an answer for, feel free to raise your hand. This is why we're here. Anybody have anything? Go on once. I know people are going to be shy. I know. I know. Everybody has it figured out. I know. I know. All right. So, Mike, I – hold on. Kelly, are you trying to unmute or no? You're just waving your finger around. All right. So, Mike, before we hop off, I do want you to share because this is very powerful. And I still listen to this YouTube video that you sent me and I shared it in this community. It's actually pinned in the guide section in our private Facebook community. But you sent me a YouTube video that one of your mentors sent you and you said it changed your life. And it talked about the subconscious. Do you remember that video that you sent me? 
Which uh, one was it? You mean it? It was. Hold on here. It was a YouTube video that pretty much it like it was based off of a book or something, and it was like a narration of this book, and it just talks about how your subconscious work ultimately. When uh, whatever you say, your subconscious starts backing it up, and it will kind of take you through that journey of verifying the shit that you're saying to yourself. So it all comes down yeah. to you versus you. Um, but yeah. I'm trying to figure out what yeah, that Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, for sure. Um, and that's it. So we operate primarily on the conscious level. Like we're talking here, this is what's happening. But but there's something else that's happening beyond like the hard drive in the back here, is which is the subconscious. And that's what really determines how we show up in life. And that's something that unless we unless we work on ourselves, we don't have the ability to tap into that. And so it's all of these things. It's the affirmations. It's the messages. It's the interactions. It's the way we conduct ourselves that really program that subconscious so that we can manifest is the word that's often used, the type of life that we need. And a really important, really powerful tool for this specifically. I don't know if it was in that video, Devin, or not. It was in, I got it. It's called Feeling is the Secret, 1944 by Neville Goddard. Goddard. That's yeah, what yeah. you sent me. Yeah, it's amazing. And, and he's, he, I mean, he hits the nail on the head and that's what it is. It's really feeling like in terms of people like talk about the power of attraction. I want this. I want a million dollars. I want that bigger house. I want the raise. That conscious level of want or desire is, is here. But we are human beings. We are creatures of feeling. You have to not only think that you want something, but you have to really be able to get to a point where your subconscious is allowing you to feel it, to live that life, to feel that life as if it's already occurred and then it occurs. One of the ways that, I, I don't know if Neville talked about it in this one or in other ones, but one of the ways people are starting to do this now is by program, programming themselves before they go to sleep. Like when you go to sleep, everybody says, okay, don't go to sleep mad at each other with your husband or wife, or your spouse. But there's much, much more to that. Like when you're going to sleep, you're programming yourself for what you're going to be thinking about for the next six or eight or 10 hours as you sleep. So you have to go into it with these positive affirmations, thankful about the things. We talk about gratitude a lot, thankful for the things that happened to you and for you and through you that day, but also about the things that you want going into the next day. Like those are the thoughts and ultimately the feelings that you should try and cultivate as you're going to sleep so that you can manifest these things that turn up like it's not a coincidence when you really start to study this stuff on the quantum level. We just went through a course with a guy named Dr. Larry Falwell, the science of creating miracles. And you really can create what we call miracles. These are just extremely unlikely events. But by doing the right things in the right way at the right time, you can create these things that people go like, why does that always happen to him or to her? There's a reason. Love that. And as an example, um, my my son and daughter, you know, every now and then they'll wake up and have, they'll say I have bad dreams or in the morning they'll say I have bad dreams. So every time I put them to bed, I always talk about like programming their mind. Hey, you know, make sure you have the best dreams ever. Make sure you have like, what do you want to dream about? That's super fun. I'll start programming, having them talk about the best dreams that they could ever have. And it's not a coincidence that they don't wake up saying that they have bad dreams because of what you just said right there. Right now, what what could happen from this call is this, right? Some of you will get off this call and be like, wow, this all makes sense, uh, cool, woo woo stuff, whatever, I get it. And then just continue to operate as you always been and let your emotions take out 50% uh, of your production or have your emotions transfer into a conversation or an attitude or, or your family or whatever. And then there's gonna be those that put into action at least two to three things that you heard from this. And next month, they're going to be like, wow, from that call, I did this. And a lot has changed for me, right? Be that person that gets uncomfortable doing the stuff that you know works, but you have to train your mind to do stuff that you haven't done before in order to achieve results that you have never achieved before, right? So that's the most important part of hearing these unbelievable entrepreneurs Come in, guys. It's like, what are you going to do about this information? What are you going to do with this information? Right? What are some things that, man, if I could really solve this or if I can really improve this, right? What are you going to implement on today's call that's going to help you attack and crush whatever that mental barrier is that you have? And that's how you get the most out of these calls on top of, on top of following Mike on Instagram, on Facebook, 
and he will continue. You'll see his journey, and you'll be reminded, like, hey, man, you know what? I saw Mike today. He's in his RV. He's investing into another business. Man, he was talking about how him and his wife did a cold plunge. He's doing whatever that is, and it's just another reminder. Get out of your own way. Let's get uncomfortable, and I, it's about time I start practicing this because every successful entrepreneur at the highest levels, there's no coincidence that they all talk about this. So when are we going to start implementing what these folks that are achieving life at the absolute max potential, we have to start doing this, right? And it's doing things that we've never done before. So Mike, I appreciate your time as always, our relationship, you pouring into Likewise. this community that I care so much about. Um, but again, the way that we thank Mike is by implementing what we just learned today. Take one or two things and start trying to make it a habit and share the call, share what you've learned with other people, because our goal is to not only change who we become, become a better person, but impact others, right? And create tidal waves through this world of, of positive impact. So Mike, thank you so much, my brother. You're amazing. Thank you. And, uh, my pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Any questions, follow up, please feel free and uh, really appreciate you, Devin, and appreciate everyone. So thanks. Safe travels. Thank you all for hopping on and making this commitment to yourself. And uh, let us know if you need anything and be active in that community. Connect, collaborate, and share with each other what you're executing from today's call. Let's push each other to, uh, to, to get to that next level. See you guys.